Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today, I'm here with a good friend, Thomas Ferrer. Uh, I actually encountered Thomas's work when I was online looking at blogs on the new Eliakim argument, and I found this one from years ago, and it just blew me away how, I mean, so many of the things that he had said on his own were things that I was saying on my own. And so I reached out to him and I was like, hey, we need to talk. I need to get to know your story. I need to get to know you as a person. And so Thomas, uh, it's so good to see you finally. Uh, could you briefly inter introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, Swan. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's a great pleasure to be in conversation with you today. Um, so I'm a Canadian, but I, I live in South Africa, Cape Town, uh, for the last 15 years or so. Um, by profession, I'm an academic in the field of statistics. Um, just recently finished my PhD in that, but haven't actually graduated yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm married. Uh, I have a, an adopted son. He's actually my my wife's son, but so you could say stepson, but I had adopted him. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a Catholic since 2017. I'm sure we'll get more into that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those are a few few things about myself. And you, so you had a moment then where you were interested in New Testament studies. Um, is, is that still kind of a side activity for you or, you know, how far did you get in that field? So I actually, I did a degree, uh, mm -hmm. a bachelor of theology honors degree uh, by correspondence in the UK with an evangelical institution because I was evangelical at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think through that process, it kind of drove me towards the Catholic church Mm. But yeah, and, and I've I've got a few publications uh, in peer-reviewed journals on uh, exegetical related topics. Most of them actually have to do with the devil. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's partly because of the religious background that I came out of, which mm -hmm. I think we'll get more into. But yeah. Yeah. So actually, um, let me give you the opportunity then to just tell us your story. So wherever you want to begin, we'll begin from there. And I, I might kind of, you know, interject here and there, maybe ask a question or, you know, flesh something out. But yeah, Thomas, what was, what's your conversion story to Catholicism? Okay, great. Happy to share. Um, so as I mentioned, I was born in Canada. I grew up in Canada in near Toronto in Ontario. Um, and I was raised in a loving home, uh, two brothers, two sisters, two loving parents. And it was a a Christadelphian family. I might need to get into some a bit of background because I don't think a lot of your audience might even have heard of that group. Um, but before a bit of background on the Christadelphians, just to say it was a very um, religious home, a very Bible-oriented upbringing. Um, used to do Bible classes in the morning with my mother before school. Um, Bible readings as a family, um, a lot of Bible study activities through the, the religious group, and um, going to church twice, typically on a Sunday. The, the morning service would be a typical um, church service with communion or memorial service, as it was called. Mm -hmm. And then the evening service would be more like an academic lecture sort of format. Uh, so you can see it was quite a cerebral kind of Bible-oriented upbringing. Of course, there were also the social events, the potlucks and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I must give a bit of background on the Christadelphians. Otherwise, my story probably won't make a lot of sense. So Christadelphians are a restorationist sect founded in the late 1840s by a British medical doctor named John Thomas, who had emigrated to the United States. So you might ask, what is rest? What is a restorationist sex? What is sect? What is restorationism? So restorationism was a religious ideal that rose to prominence in the USA in the first half of the 1800s. And it basically had two main premises. The first premise is that the Catholic Church and the Protestant denominations of the day were all corrupt. And indeed, the very idea of denomination, denominationalism that had arisen after the Reformation was considered to be deeply flawed. And secondly, the antidote to this problem was to restore the ancient gospel 
by attending to the plain truths of the Bible. So in particular, unlike, you know, your mainline Protestant denominations, uh, restorationists generally would have, would believe that the apostasy, as they call it, or the corruption of the church occurred very early, almost like the generation after the apostles died, things started to go horribly wrong. And, you know, therefore the, the creeds of the fourth century and, um, anything that happened sort of after the time of the apostles is considered to be suspect. Mm -hmm. And even the, the 16th century Protestant reformation might be regarded as necessary, but inadequate. It didn't go far enough. Um, and there, there's actually quite a few religious groups that exist today that have their roots in this restoration movement, such as the disciples of Christ, the churches of Christ, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists have some roots there, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Latter-day Saints, and the Christadelphians, which are one of the lesser known uh, of those. Um, now, of course, there are among that group, if you talk about the Latter-day Saints, for example, their antidote also had an injection of new revelation, as they saw it. So there are subtle differences between the groups, but they mm -hmm. all sort of work from that same fundamental worldview. Now, the most prominent restoration movement of the 1800s, early 1800s, was what scholars call the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement. And its, its main sort of de facto leader was Alexander Campbell. Um, he was the editor of its main periodical magazine, like monthly magazine, and that was the main sort of organ of a religious movement in the early 1800s. So this medical doctor, John Thomas, um, became kind of the protege of Alexander Campbell uh, after he converted to this restoration movement in the early 1830s. But um, they soon had a falling out, uh, Campbell and Thomas, and then Campbell, basic, uh, Thomas rather, he had started his own periodical. And within, you know, a decade, a decade and a half, he had basically completely split off and in, in fact, had himself rebaptized because he considered that his baptism in the Campbell Restoration Movement, he didn't see it as valid anymore because he thought his understanding of the gospel at the time was flawed. So he actually had himself rebaptized in the in about 1847, and that was sort of the genesis of what became the Christadelphian movement, as some of the people that he had associated with over the years sort of went with him in this new this new trajectory and uh and just the, the, to, oh sorry yep no go I, ahead i just wanted to ask um so this this movement then would not be considered protestant they wouldn't want them to be they want, wouldn't want to be considered that way um i i think they would acknowledge that they come out of the protestant tradition mm -hmm. but um they wouldn't most christadelphians traditionally would regard Protestants, most Protestants, as being not real Christians. So their mm -hmm. their baptisms are not valid. So they're not actual Christians. They're apostate. Um, their faith is sort of in vain. Mm. Um, there are sort of more liberal Christadelphians that have come to see themselves more as another denomination within the big Protestant family. So I think there's a spectrum of sure. beliefs on that. Mm. All right, but yeah, do, so, do continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the, the new religious movement initially didn't have a name, but at the time of the American Civil War, uh, they were conscientious objectors. They didn't serve in the military, and for them to register for that purpose, they needed a name, so they decided to call themselves Christadelphians, which basically means you know brothers in Christ. Um, and Thomas himself was a tireless evangelist, in the Eastern USA, uh, Southern Canada, as well as his native Britain. And so many congregations, which are known by Christadelphians as ecclesias, from the, the Greek word ekklesia, um, were founded before his death in 1871. And then from there, the movement continued to grow, but never really took off. So today, I think a rough global estimate of the number of Christadelphians in the world is about 50,000. And most of these are concentrated in English-speaking countries. So then what do Christadelphians believe in practice? Um, I'll start with a few practices. 
first of all, the local ecclesia, the local congregation is completely autonomous. So there's no synods, there's no representative decision-making body. One, one ecclesia can't tell another ecclesia what to do. Mm -hmm. And they're also governed congregationally, so there's no hierarchy. And one of the consequences of this is that I've sort of already alluded to it. There's a lot of diversity in beliefs and practices across different ecclesias, since there's no way of standardizing practice and, and beliefs. So, for example, there is and can never be an official Christadelphian position on, say, an issue like abortion, because it wasn't a hot button issue in the 1800s when the group was founded. And there's no way of formulating a formal consensus on what the Christadelphian position is today. So every Christadelphian will sort of have their own view or every ecclesia, at least. There's also no ordained clergy or paid ministry. So baptized members in most ecclesias, only the male members take turns presiding over the services and giving the homilies, which are called words of exhortation. Mm. There's also no seminaries or formal training structures, theological training structures. Uh, but there is a very strong emphasis on individual Bible study by all members. And so, you know, you might find that if you meet a Christadelphian, I think the average Christadelphian would sort of put the average Catholic or maybe even Protestant to shame in terms of their, their Bible knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, one becomes a member of the Christadelphians through believers baptism. And unlike a lot of Protestants, um, Christadelphians actually share in common with Catholics that uh, they believe baptism is regenerative. So it's not merely a sim symbolic exercise. Um, and this baptism normally takes place after an oral examination or interview, which is done to ensure that the candidate has the required level of knowledge and commitment. The congregations meet every Sunday and that for that, for what they call the memorial service as their communion services are called. So they, they have, communion every Sunday. And, you know, marriage outside of the community is discouraged, but not that uncommon. Coming to the doctrinal beliefs, um, a big one is that God is believed to be unipersonal, the Father, mm. and hence they reject the dogma of the Trinity. Um, interestingly, though, the, the founder of Christadelphians, Dr. John Thomas, he emphatically denied that his view of God was unitarian. Um, and at times, I would say his language bordered on pantheistic. Mm -hmm. But most Christadelphians, I think today, would embrace the label of biblical Unitarian. So they do consider themselves as having a Unitarian view of God. As for Christ, uh, Jesus is considered the ontologically human, not divine Messiah, whose personal existence began with his virginal conception in Mary's womb. So he didn't pre-exist. He's not ontologically God. The Holy Spirit is the impersonal power of God and also a, a distinct feature of Christadelphian belief about the Holy Spirit is that traditionally Christadelphians have believed that the Holy Spirit is basically inactive since soon after the apostles died mm. and is currently basically inaccessible to the church. The only way that we have access to the Holy Spirit is through scripture because scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit doesn't, you know, work in our hearts directly in that sort of thing. Um, and, and so consequently, there's a very, what I would call a very low ecclesiology. Um, I think the term ecclesial deism is an apt description of it because it's almost as though Christ is not actively governing his ecclesia, his church. It's up to us through diligent human effort to discern and disseminate divine truth as best we can. Um, so I think that's quite a distinctive feature of Christadelphian belief as distinguishing from other Protestants, I would say. Then in terms of eschatology, there's a an expectation of a future earthly kingdom of God to be inaugurated by the return of Christ, which is expected very soon. Um, so it's an Adventist movement in that sense. And then they believe in bodily resurrection as the only kind of conscious existence after death, and therefore they deny the existence of an immaterial soul or its subsistence after death. Um, the fate of the unredeemed is believed to be annihilation, basically non-existence, as opposed to a traditional doctrine of hell. Uh, 
and the the devil is viewed as a symbolic way of describing human evil and not a real transcendent being last but not least uh traditionally christadelphians have understood the roman catholic church to be the great whore of revelation 17 and the pope to be the antichrist so you know not a very positive view of the roman catholic church among most christadelphians so that's you know that that's kind of the background that that's the movement that i was raised in so i don't know if you have any questions or i should jump back to my own story no, i mean i mean this is very fascinating um so uh, like like you mentioned before it it seemed like it was a, a very i don't i don't know if this is the right word but rationalistic kind of christianity uh, if we can be called a, a christianity um but anyway leaving that aside um you know so it was just the bible alone and using human knowledge and comprehension to govern the church. And with the idea of the Holy Spirit not being active, they would also deny miracles still happen? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I yeah. think most Christadelphians would allow a sense of providence. So it's not as though Christadelphians are not going to pray because they don't think God will intervene. That, that won't be an accurate mm -hmm. description, but I don't think... Um, I wouldn't say I've, as a Christadelphian, I heard a lot of reflection on like the mechanism or the means by which God might be active and present in the world. Um, th there was a very strong sense that God is active in the geopolitical events of the world. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of doing miracles, um, I think if someone said in a Christadelphian context that you know, I was miraculously healed or something like that. I think there would be a lot of eyebrows raised. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very interesting, but anyway, um, the rest, the rest of your story. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think, you know, with this upbringing, I would say in my middle teens, I, I developed a sense of a need for God in my life and a zeal for the scriptures as I had been taught. Um, and I actually, in my mid-teens, I became an online Christadelphian apologist. Uh, this was the late 90s, mm -hmm. so there wasn't social media yet, but I created my own website. Um, you can actually still view it via the web archive if, if you want to. It was biblebeliefs.net. Mm -hmm. And then at the age of 17, I was then baptized by my grandfather. Uh, my family were, I think, fifth or sixth generation Christadelphians on both sides. Uh, so it was like a strong family pedigree. But I would say within about a year after my baptism, I had my first crisis of conviction. And it actually had to do with this subject of the devil, because uh, my grandfather, who was a, you know, a prominent writer in the movement, he, he gave me a pamphlet to read by a gentleman by the name of Sir Anthony Buzzard. Now he is, he is a teacher and leader in the Church of God General Conference, which is another Unitarian restoration restorationist movement, but which differs from the Christadelphians in that they hold a more traditional view of the devil as a transcendent being. So, uh, this gentleman Anthony Buzzard had written a brochure, basically refuting the Christadelphian view of the devil and arguing why biblically the devil is a real personal being so my grandfather gave me this brochure to read and said you know maybe you'd like to to write a re refutation of this since you're you know this budding apologist mm -hmm. and you know when i encountered the the arguments that he made i was like man these are pretty strong and <laughs> it really shook it really mm -hmm. shook my my understanding that that my uh doctrinal positions were you know unimpeachable and that was huge because you know, for Christadelphians, one standing before God is really predicated on doctrinal purity, or at least that that's how I, I was brought up. And that's how I viewed the world. So if my doctrines are now flawed, then my whole salvation and my whole stance before God is called into question. So I was really worried now, what if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. And I would say these nagging doubts actually sapped away my spiritual zeal, my zeal to be an apologist. And I sort of started going through the motions. Um, and 
that coincided also with my university years. And I would say that became kind of like a period of spiritual darkness and moral rebellion where I was sort of actively walking away from God because I was a bit angry that I've, I'm now confused about uh, my doctrinal beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I wouldn't say that I stopped believing in God, but I was kind of like actively rebelling against him, I would say. Um, Then over the next couple of years, I would say what started to awaken my spiritual zeal was actually reading some evangelical Christian literature that landed on my lap, maybe friends giving it to me and so on, mostly of more of a devotional nature than a theological nature, but Mm -hmm. just focusing on God's love and grace and, you know, emphasizing the that Jesus is, is a real living person. It sounds obvious, but, you know, as opposed to sort of a doctrinal idea and mm-hmm. that one can have a relationship with Jesus. And this was, I found this comforting and I was able at that point to kind of trust in Jesus and ask him to make himself known in my life and make his will known to me. Mm-hmm. And I think that that brought a sense of kind of peace into my life where I was then uh, I got my zeal back to to go and study the scriptures, but I did so not really as an apologist mm-hmm. trying to defend Christadelphian views, but sort of, you know, Christ, lead me wherever you want to take me, uh, reveal yourself to me through the scriptures. So as I, as I studied um, the Bible and, you know, read other books as well, theological literature and so on, I started to come to some conclusions that were at odds with the Christadelphian doctrines of not only the devil, but things like the pre-existence of Christ. I saw that, no, there's actually quite a lot of biblical evidence for the pre-existence of Christ. Mm -hmm. And and this kind of left me in like a ecclesiastical no man's land because I could no longer formally assent to the Christadelphian statement of faith because I was kind of starting to gravitate towards doctrines that are explicitly rejected there. But at the same time, I didn't want to leave the Christadelphian community because that's, you know, that was my my family, my friends, my social circle, um, and I didn't know of any other community where I would rather belong, you know. Mm. And around this time, I made a a huge decision in terms of the direction of my life, uh, which was to travel to Africa. Um, initially, I think the reason was because I heard about some Christadelphians in South Africa that were really involved in um, social outreach, poverty alleviation activities, charitable work. And that really inspired me because it wasn't, it wasn't really a major emphasis of uh, the Christadelphians that I knew of in in North America. Um, And, and I felt like it could be sort of a healthy distraction where I could get my mind off of these theological hangups and just focus on, you know, serving God and serving my neighbor. So I I traveled to South Africa for a few months after completing my university studies in 2007. And to make a long story short, um, after going back to Canada in 2008, I was supposed to start my PhD studies then. I Mm -hmm. actually did start them. But within like three or four months, I just couldn't get into it. And I felt like part of me was back in Africa. And I was feeling called to go back there and you know a lot of soul searching a lot of prayer um, reflection about this decision but eventually I felt like no I'm at peace with this I'm going back so I um, informed my my family and then I moved back to to stay in Durban South Africa on the Indian Ocean coast and I was actually volunteering for a charity there for about four years that was uh, run by a Christadelphian. Um, and while there, I was uh, actually the Christadelphian ecclesia that I was attending on a weekly basis. It was one of the sort of satellite ecclesias that was created through the charitable work. And most of the attendees were like young children. I mean, it was mm-hmm. basically a Sunday school. So there were a few adults, maybe about six to 10 adults on a typical Sunday. And then there would be like a Sunday school lesson for all these kids. And then we would sort of have our own Bible study afterwards on the side. And it was like, um, almost like anything, I don't want to say anything goes, but it was very informal. I mean, it was 
very tolerant. You could sort of come in there and say something that if you wanted to, that wasn't um, Orthodox Christadelphian teaching and nobody was really going to bat an eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I, I sort of felt comfortable there uh, not having to really confront the doctrinal issues that I was dealing with. But at the same time, I also started a blog and that sort of gave me an outlet to sort of write some of the ideas that I had. And I think that that started maybe creating a little bit of uh, discomfort for some of the Christadelphians that I was associating with in South Africa, because, you know, they're associated with me and now I'm publishing ideas that are not according to Christadelphian teaching, which I think is fair enough. Mm -hmm. So I think it was almost like at some point something had to give because I wasn't really Christadelphian in my beliefs anymore, but I was still sort of hanging on. And I think what, what ultimately gave was that, you know, a young lady came into my life, um, who's now my wife. Uh, her name is Ayanda. And um, I think after I'd been in South Africa about a year, that's where we met. Mm -hmm. um, she was actually a Baha'i. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that religion. Sorry, excuse me. Um, just a glitch with my camera. But anyway, no, I'm not familiar with that religion. Okay. Well, I, I won't really get into it, but it's uh, it's it's a religion that came out of Iran as a, an offshoot of Islam. Um, it's a monotheistic religion, but sort of, um, I think it came about in the 1800s as well. So she was following that religion, although her mother was a devout Christian. So she would come with me to this Sunday school project, but, you know, as she wasn't a Christian and as I was kind of a confused Christian, at some point I was kind of concerned that going to what's effectively a little kid Sunday school every Sunday isn't really feeding us spiritually. So um, at that point, kind of randomly on a particular Sunday, I went to a Methodist church service. I think the Sunday school was closed or something. So I went to a Methodist service. And through seeing a notice on a bulletin board at the back of that church, I got involved with a prison ministry. And it's it's actually called Kairos. I think it's active in the U.S. as well. So through that prison ministry, I met this wonderful pastoral couple. And we then, uh, Ayanda and I then started attending their church. And I would describe it as a Pentecostal um African Pentecostal type of church, um, very charismatic. And I was the only white person in the congregation. Um, it was, the services were in Zulu, which I could by this time kind of understand. And in that environment, you know, Ayanda found faith in Christ and she was actually baptized by that pastor. And soon after that, we got, we became engaged and, uh, just a cultural aside, uh, in most of Africa, one of the practices associated with marriage is called lobola. It uh, could be translated as bride price. So the the husband basically has to pay traditionally in cows, but nowadays you know cash is okay as well. Um, <laughs> has to pay the the wife's family a bride price. Now it's not as though you're buying the woman. That's a misunderstanding. It's it's a little bit like you know in Western culture. The man buys an engagement ring and it's supposed to be expensive because it's, you know, it's showing a sign of commitment. So it's almost like a gesture to the to the girl's family to say, you know, you raised this wonderful young lady and now she's going to be with me. So here's, you know, a gesture from to unite our families. Um, so you have to have there's a negotiation process that goes on to just kind of decide you know, how much is actually going to be exchanged here and because normally the uncles on both sides will be the negotiators you know my uncles are in canada and they don't know anything about zulu culture so this pastoral couple actually stepped in and they were my negotiators so you know we got we got through that process it was a learning learning curve for me to to be sure and we got married and then after we got married we actually moved to cape town a few months later which is on the opposite side of the country, on the Atlantic Ocean side of South Africa. That was because I got a job there. Um, and we joined a Baptist church. I, I think it was like 
Baptist church felt like um, kind of close to Christadelphian beliefs in some ways, but but still, you know, more orthodox, more evangelical, which was where where my convictions were at the time. And that basically that move basically spelled the end of my direct association with Christadelphians, you know, in a religious sense. Although, you know, of course, I'm still close to my family, close to my Christadelphian friends and so on. And it was at this time also that I decided to pursue formal theological studies. And I think my main motivation for doing that, it wasn't really that I aspired to be a pastor. It was more that I wanted to use that process to kind of clear up my own theological convictions, because I wasn't really sure where I stood on a whole number of th theological issues. And I felt like, you know, if I just become better at biblical exegesis, like mm -hmm. everything will become clear and I'll sort out all of these issues that I have. So I did that. And I would say that, you know, the, the I'll, I really enjoyed my theological studies. I, I'm so glad that I did it. It was a, a gift from God that I was able to do it. But I would say that one of the big realizations that came out of that experience was, you know, theology is really difficult. <laughs> it, it's, it's not as though I can just, sit down with a Bible and study, 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 you know, learn Greek, and then everything will become clear. And I will just have certainty about my doctrinal beliefs. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that at all, because, you know, in an academic setting, you have to do all these essays and assignments, and you'll be given a topic or maybe a biblical passage. And you're expected to read widely so that you see all the different viewpoints that exist among scholars. And then you form your own viewpoints and argue for that viewpoint. And, you know, quite often it was like, it wasn't like an 80-20 kind of decision. It was like 50-50 or 55-45. Mm -hmm. Like it was really tough to decide which position I was going to take. So that uh, that kind of led me to believe, to ask a, a difficult question. I would say an epistemological question, which is if determining doctrine is the prerogative and duty of every believer then why did God make it so difficult? Mm. That was a question I really struggled with because that had been my assumption all along that as an individual believer, it's my job um, and it's my right to figure out doctrine, you know, Christian doctrine. And so I think three possible answers to that conundrum kind of presented themselves to me. One was basically scripture is a proving ground that, rewards only the most diligent and honest with the truth. Um, but that to me didn't seem satisfying because it seems at odds with the, the, the emphasis of scripture on grace and that God loves the poor and the simple. And, you know, Paul's claim that ultimately human boasting is excluded because if it is actually all about human diligence and effort, then maybe we do have cause for boasting if we have managed to arrive at the, the truth. Mm -hmm. so then the second option that I thought of was, well, maybe doctrinal truth just doesn't matter. Like maybe God is not really interested in whether our doctrines are correct. Maybe there isn't even a doctrinal truth to be discovered. Maybe it's all relative sort of thing. Mm. Um, as long as we're sincere and we treat each other well and are good people, then that's really what matters. But again, that seemed to me to be patently at odds with the new Testament's emphasis on the importance of doctrinal truth and the dangers of doctrinal error. So that didn't really seem satisfactory either. So the, the third option that came to me is, well, maybe the premise is wrong. Maybe determining doctrine is not the prerogative and duty of the individual believer. But if, if that's the case, then whose prerogative is it now? And then at the same time, you know, through my engagement with patristic literature, with the church fathers, through my theological studies, it seemed obvious that for church fathers like Irenaeus of Lyon, um, the rule of faith, as he calls it, was something that was handed down from the apostles with the church as its custodian. So this made me more open, I would say, to the, the possibility that oral tradition forms part of the deposit of faith and also more open to a high ecclesiology where the, the church itself um, has an important role to play in preserving doctrine and it's not just about the individual mm -hmm. so while while all this is going on in my head 
uh, one of my cousins back in Canada was busy um, converting to Catholicism, little known to me. But then mm -hmm. he he shared with me, I think, one of Bishop Barron's uh, YouTube videos. And I started watching Bishop Barron's YouTube videos. And I was like, you know, all these preconceptions that I had about Catholics sort of having this vague waffle of a theology that, that it's all shrouded in mystery and nobody really knows what it's all about. Mm. And here I, I see this Catholic, I, I don't know if he was already a bishop at the time, but priest or bishop um, expounding very clearly and convincingly um, certain truths of the faith. Um, so I think that was also a, sort of a wake up to me. And then I think at the same time, I was also dealing with a more personal um, question that I had for myself. And that was the question of how does one deal with one's own post-baptismal sins? Because, you know, as a Christadelphian believing in baptismal regeneration, it's like, okay, when I was baptized, all my sins were washed away. But then I was very conscious that I'd continued to sin after that. So how do, how do I deal with that? And the answer that I'd encountered up until then as a Christadelphian, as a Baptist, it was basically like repent and pray to God for forgiveness and then move on. You know, it's it's sorted. But uh, that, that didn't really satisfy me. And as I read about the, the Catholic sacrament of reconciliation, also known as going to confession, I found that idea um, deeply satisfying that the church would actually play an intermediary role in absolving the faithful from their post-baptismal sins. And, and I actually developed a, a strong thirst for this particular sacrament. And I wanted to like go to a Catholic priest, see a Catholic priest and maybe go to confession. I wasn't sure if that was allowed because I wasn't a Catholic. So <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I actually, you know, made an appointment. I think this was around 2015 I made an appointment to see the priest of the local Catholic parish. And, you know, he explained to me that the sacrament of reconciliation is only for, for Catholics. But, um, and I said to him, well, you know, I'm, I come from a very anti-Catholic background, but I'm kind of interested in engaging more with Catholicism. And he said, well, the right thing to do with then would be to join our RCIA program. Mm -hmm. So I started attending the RCIA classes and here, I'm, I'm not sure elsewhere in the world, but here it goes on a yearly cycle with um, Easter, the Easter vigil being the time when all the candidates are confirmed and baptized if necessary. So I, I went through the RCIA process, which was to conclude in, at Easter 2016. And at the same time, I read the catechism of the Catholic Church, all, you know, 2,800 propositions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and... Um, I, I, you know, read other literature and I, there was a website called called to communion. I'm not sure if you're yeah. familiar mm -hmm. with it, but I've also read a lot of the articles there. But at Easter 2016, I, I just wasn't ready. Um, all the other candidates from the RCIA class were confirmed, but I told the, the priest and the deacon that led the class that I'm just not ready. Uh, I need more time to process this. It was going to be a big, um, a big thing for my family. I mean, my wife as well, because she's not, she's not a Catholic. She wasn't doing RCAA. So she wasn't like in the same place on her spiritual journey. And, you know, we have a, a teenager at this time and what's this going to do to him as well. So I spent another year uh, working through things for myself. And, um, you know, I would be attending a Baptist service in the morning and then a Catholic mass in the evening on a Sunday and through that year, I, I made my peace with the decision that, yes, I do. I do want to become Catholic. I believe the Catholic faith. And so at the 2017 Easter Vigil, that's when I was baptized, confirmed, and received my first Holy Communion. Mm. Uh, now, you might say, what, why were you baptized? I thought you were already baptized. But um, the Catholic Church does not recognize Christadelphian baptism as being valid because Christadelphians do right. not believe in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, I had to be baptized when I entered the Catholic Church. And that that also, I suppose, gets back to your earlier uh, point of, are Christadelphians actually Christians? So formally speaking, mm 
from a Catholic perspective, Christadelphians are not uh, Christians. They're not part of the church because they don't have valid baptism. Mm -hmm. um, it, I would say it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, Christadelphians can't be saved because we know that the Catholic church teaches that um, even, you know, Muslims or others that are not Christians could, we don't say that they will be saved, but we say that it's possible God can save them um, in his own ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that in a nutshell is an account of my journey to becoming a Catholic. And I've, you know, been a Catholic ever since. And um, my confirmation saint, by the way, was St. Justin Martyr, who's, mm -hmm. whose writings made a big impact on, on my journey. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Thomas, um, I know this might be a personal question, but it's one that a lot of converts have to deal with, which is how did your family react? How did your friends react? You know, um, I mean, starting with the first kind of conversion from going from the Christadelphians to being Baptist, did you get a, a sharp reaction from people or was it kind of maybe that's weird, but they didn't really press you too hard on it? Um, I, I think in some ways that was the big one. That, really? that was the okay. one that, hmm. because number one, um, my questioning of Christadelphian theology started when I was still in Canada. So I was still, you know, very physically, very close to my immediate family and, you know, mm -hmm. attending services with them and all of that. Um, and, you know, by challenging those Christadelphian doctrines, I was already from a Christadelphian standpoint, already sort of placing myself outside of the the boundaries of you know truth and therefore salvation in a sense mm -hmm. so i i'd already taken the all important step of kind of deserting the faith and so um for me to then later on be, uh become formally become a baptist and then become a catholic it was sort of like okay well he's just wandering further away but i mean he was already mm -hmm. out you know Hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I would have been regarded as, as lost from the, the flock, so, so to speak, from the time that I, uh, even, even before I formally left the Christadelphians, but even from the time that I was, you know, entertaining doctrinal ideas that were contrary to, to Christadelphian beliefs. Hmm. So I think, you know, it, it was difficult for, for my family. I had some know tough conversations with my parents at that time and even you know when when i became a catholic of course i informed my my parents and you know there was a strong reaction but um i wouldn't say that it's even though i'm far away um but i would say i still have a very good relationship with my family and mm -hmm. it hasn't really um it hasn't really caused us to lose the love that we have as a family or anything like that um, and I still have, you know, the last time I was visiting uh, my family in Canada, which was last year in July, you know, I had some good heart to heart discussions with my dad, say about theology. And, you know, we didn't agree, but I think there was respect there to say, okay, uh, I can see where you're coming from. And I can see that these are your actual convictions. You're sincere about this on both sides. So, um, yeah, it's, it can be an emotional conversation. Uh, some members of my family, I don't think I could have that conversation with because it would just get too emotional. And I, I know from your, from hearing your testimony, that was something that you mm -hmm. can relate to, I think. Um, so yeah. It, and there are, you know, friendships that I um, drifted, drifted apart from because of my spiritual journey. Um, so yeah, there have been, has been pain along the way for sure. And it hasn't always been easy, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to, we have to follow our convictions. And I think most people who also are people of conviction will, will respect when somebody else follows their own convictions, even if they don't necessarily agree with them. So going now to, um, you know, the, ar the argument that I saw you write out in your blog, and I'll try to put it on, uh, you know, the YouTube description where you kind of laid out the Peter to lie come argument. Um, I remember in, on the Google doc, you mentioned that there were some points that you wanted to bring up in particular about the argument. So let me just ask you first, how did you get exposed to it? And what are these uh, insights that you have that I found really fascinating? 
uh, in the comments on the side of the document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I think I probably first became aware of the Peter Eliakim argument from reading commentaries on the gospel of Matthew. I can't yep. remember yep. even which commentary it was, but you know, scholars will, mm -hmm. will, will often point out that, okay, there is possibly a literary connection here between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. So when, uh, when Peter makes his confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and then Jesus responds with this profound declaration to Peter in verse in Matthew 16, verse 17 to 19, that this is somehow um, alluding to or reflecting a, a similar set of statements that occurs in Isaiah 22 about this figure, uh, the master of the palace, Eliakim in the Davidic uh, kingdom. Um, now, I found it fascinating and decided to write about it, I would say, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, I'm writing partly for kind of a Christadelphian and Unitarian audience. Now, if, if you told an audience of Christadelphians that a strong biblical case can be made for the Roman Catholic doctrine of the papacy, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think they would be able to control themselves from bursting out laughing. Yeah. Not out of rudeness. They would just think it's a ridiculous thing to say. Right. And yeah. so I, I think there's there's just a lack of awareness out there that, you know, there is actually biblical evidence and a biblical argument to be made for the papacy. And secondly, um, I think most Christadelphians have the impression, I know that I used to have the impression, that most other Christadel uh, Christians, and above all Catholics, are pretty ignorant of Scripture and if they do read scripture, it's only the New Testament. So that I think a lot of Christadelphians sort of feel like the Old Testament is our turf. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where we'll win the, the theological battle, so to speak, because mm -hmm. other Christians just don't know the Old Testament. And so we can see the connections, say, between the Abrahamic covenant and, you know, what, what we find in the New Testament about the call of the Gentiles or any number of other issues, you know, types of Christ in the Old Testament that we find fulfilled in, in the new. And so in that context, to make an argument based on a connection between a gospel passage and an oracle in Isaiah, I think it could be particularly powerful and persuasive to Christadelphians because it precisely asks us to do what Christadelphians like to do, and that is to read a New Testament passage through the lens of an Old Testament background. So that that's that's what I would say is how I got into this passage and why I decided to write a blog article about it. And you mentioned um, in the video, or excuse me, in the um, the video notes that uh, you have a particular connection or thought on how binding and loosing and opening and shutting are connected because you know Matthew sixteen nineteen Jesus says to Peter, "Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven; whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Isaiah twenty two twenty two says. Whatever you open, none shall shut. Whatever you shut, none shall open. Uh, what are your thoughts on how the two are connected? Okay, so yeah, there, there's a couple of maybe insights that I've come across since I wrote the blog article, so they're not in the article. Before I get to the binding and loosing, if I can, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to mention one other Old Testament parallel that I think is relevant mm. to Matthew 16. Now, if if you were to ask yourself who's an Old Testament figure who was appointed as a high official, second in command under the king, uh, who would come to mind? Joseph. Joseph. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I when I read um, Genesis 41, 38 to 44, I'm just going to kind of quote it to you, if you don't mind, from mm -hmm. the NRSV. Um, he says, Pharaoh pronounces to Joseph... Since God has shown you all this, now right away, notice a parallel to what happens in Matthew 16, where uh, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father in heaven. So Pharaoh says, since God has shown you all this, you shall be over all my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. And then skipping down a bit, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Thus Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. Now, as um, Duncan Derrett points out in a 
an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature, uh, he, he refers us to Psalm 105, where there's a, a retelling of this story. Mm -hmm. And just to quote a couple of verses there from verse 18 to 23, par parts of that. Um, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who had been sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. And then note this part, to bind his officials at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. So the, the Hebrew word there literally means to bind. And so, and, and there also seems to be kind of a literary play here whereby Joseph himself was previously bound, you know, mm -hmm. in fetters as a slave. And now he's loosed and given authority to bind others. So I think one can make an argument for a Joseph Peter connection to be explored as well as an Eliakim Peter connection. Although I would admit that the Eliakim Peter connection is stronger because you know you have the mention of these key, of the key or the keys and then um, an authority that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Now, a as you alluded to, um, okay, before I go on any, any comment or question around the Joseph parallel? Yeah, you know, um, what is it? I had recently a uh, William Albrecht and Father Christian Caps on my channel, and they, in their book, um, The Papacy in the Bible, they do talk about uh, the connection to Joseph. And I think they do talk about the binding portion there in, in Psalms. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to say. Well, I mean, and, and then other scholars have noted that the I, Isaiah 22 passage seems to call upon, right, Genesis and what happened with Joseph, the language of being placed over the house or over the palace, right? That appears again there. So, I mean, it's either it's either the case that the office of chief steward in ancient Israel was based off of Joseph's position, or it was described in a way that was reminiscent of Joseph's position. Either one is, you know, on the table. But anyway, yeah, so there, there is a, I think there is room for bringing in also Genesis, as you put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. So there can be kind of a indirect, maybe the link from Joseph to Matthew is indirect via Isaiah, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think secondly, um, a, a possible objection that one could make to the Eliakim Simon Peter parallel is that Eliakim receives a key that gives him mm -hmm. unimpeachable, unimpeachable authority to open and shut. Whereas Peter is given keys that give him unimpeachable authority to bind and loose things on earth so it's two different metaphors the metaphors don't match opening and shutting binding and loosing so i would say in response you know that the verbs might convey different images but they're not that different for example a person can could be imprisoned by shutting a door or by binding with a chain and released by opening a door or loosing a chain and in my view if you look at the expression where jesus says i will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven there are it's it seems to be envisioned that peter is going to be unlocking or locking something because mm -hmm. that's what you do with keys so the question is what does jesus envision that peter is going to lock or unlock and there's two options that that i think one could argue for making a pretty good argument either way the first one uh, this, the biblical scholar Joel Marcus is one of the proponents of this. And he argues that the image is of unlocking city gates. So basically, um, because in, in the previous verse, it talked about the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. So now when it mentions the keys to the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be the gates of the kingdom of heaven that are unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in support of this, Matthew 23, 13 speaks of the scribes and Pharisees locking the kingdom of heaven, preventing people from entering. So presumably the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven would be for unlocking its gates, just as Matthew 16, 18 says that Hades has gates. Mm -hmm. So in Marcus's view, Peter is able to unlock the gates of heaven to release God's kingdom and power onto the earth. And under this reading, the keys do not perform the binding and loosing action but happen prior to them and enable them because you know, the gates the gates of heaven swing open and now the, the power and kingdom of God are released onto the earth. And that's why, you know, Peter can now exercise this binding and loosing authority. 
Um, and, you know, the, the giving of the keys would thus enable fulfillment of the Lord's prayer petition, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, on earth as in heaven. Mm -hmm. Because now the, the church has the authority to, to make known the will of, of God on earth. However, um, since in Matthew 23, 13, locking the kingdom prevents people from entering, it doesn't prevent God's power from getting out. So if Marcus is correct that Peter's keys are for unlocking the gates of heaven, this may be to enable the church to access God and thus know his will. Similar to, you know, in Isaiah 22, I think a key function of Eliakim's key as master of the palace was to control other people's access to the throne room, to the right. king, mm -hmm. rather than to allow, you know, the king out, right? That mm -hmm. wouldn't make much sense. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. to, go to, to, to keep the king under wraps um so uh, yeah i i think there's some possibly merit to joel marcus's view but if if the keys are for opening the gates of heaven i would see it as allowing uh humanity to a better access to god and his will rather than necessarily to allow god out so to speak right mm -hmm. but there is a second option that i want to mention and this is I'm not really really sure whether it's the argument for it is better, but it's a very interesting idea. And the second option is that the keys of the kingdom of heaven are actually for binding and loosing. Mm. And the best evidence, I think, for this is that Matthew's language suggests a direct link between the keys and the binding and loosing, because he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind. And he goes on. So it almost sounds like the keys are the instrument of the binding and loosing. Mm -hmm. But in that case, the metaphor, the, the image behind Matthew's metaphor is not unlocking a city gate, but binding or loosing a slave or a prisoner by unlocking a padlock that would secure a pair of manacles or a chain. Now, I, I wanted to know whether this idea is historically plausible. So I actually did a bit of reading. For instance, there's an article by Hugh Thompson, um, an archaeological journal article called Iron Age and Roman Slave Shackles. And it seems to be the definitive treatment on the subject of Roman shackles. And it is clear from Thompson's archaeological research that by the first century, the Romans were using shackles that had lock and key mechanisms. So it was literally possible in you know, the Mathean context in the first century to use a key to bind or loose somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, Matthew is not talking about binding or literally binding or loosing people. Uh, by you know releasing them from shackles it's he's abstracted the metaphor be, and we know this because the greek uses neuter relative pronouns so it doesn't say whomever you bind and loose but it says whatever you bind and loose but the imagery itself could could still be drawn from the context either of enslavement or imprisonment and indeed when we look at most occurrences of the verbs deo to bind and luo to loose in the New Testament, most of them are related to binding someone with chains. For example, the demoniac in Mark chapter 5, several times the apostles being chained in, in Acts, Paul being chained in Colossians. Uh, in Revelation 20, the dragon is bound with a heavy chain and locked by key in the abyss. Um, and, and the Pauline epistles also describe Paul's imprisonment using the the, the noun version of, of the word, which is desmoi, meaning bonds, in Philippians, Colossians, 2 Timothy, and Philemon. So perhaps um, I want to suggest, at least as a possibility, that um, you will bind and loose is basically the, the imagery is drawn from someone being enslaved or um, imprisoned. Mm. Now, and and I, I would note that maybe these two views are not ne necessarily mutually exclusive because Matthew does speak of keys in the plural. It might be a bit far-fetched to say, but perhaps Matthew has in mind that there's going to be keys unlocking the gates of heaven, but there's also going to be keys binding and loosing. But I I don't think it's that likely that he has both idea, both images in mind. Mm. But then what is, since Clearly, binding and loosing is used metaphorically in Matthew 16, 19, regardless of where the image comes from. Um, what is 
the significance, what does Matthew actually mean that Peter is going to do when he binds and looses? So most scholars think that it refers to halakhic rulings, in other words, authoritative application of the scriptures to life. This is contested, but I think it's it's the clear majority view, maybe mm-hmm. even the consensus. And it's the view that that I think is most persuasive. And I think one doesn't always notice this, but we, we have hints of such language already in Paul's letters, which are written before Matthew. Uh, Romans, for example, says in chapter 7, verse 2, that a married woman is bound by law to her living husband, but if her husband dies, she is released. Mm. So there's this idea of marriage being a, a bond, binding and loosing. And again, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 27, um, Paul says, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek loosing. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Um, so the law is actually depicted metaphorically here as a shackle that chains a husband and wife together. Now we could probably make a few marriage jokes <laughs> at that point, mm-hmm. but, um, um, but you know, th- there were different mechanisms in the Roman world for chaining people together. And that's probably the, the image that Paul is drawing on here. You had a, a gang chain where multiple slaves had neck collars on that would be linked together with chains. So they would be, you know, chained bound to one another. And also you have this idea where a, a a prisoner would be secured to a soldier via a chain. So the prisoner would have manacles on mm. and then the there would be a chain connecting the manacles to the soldier's wrist. And then the soldier would hold the key so that, you know, if he needs to separate them, then he can. So either of these is a possible background to the, to Paul's idea of two people being bound together. But the key thing is that um, it, it's not far from Paul's metaphor of the law binding together two people in marriage to, in a sense of mutual obligations. Mm-hmm. It's not a far stretch to binding and loosing as a metaphor for obligating and releasing from obligations or prohibiting and permitting. And and that's the ideas that we find in rabbinic literature. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And already in the Mishnah, which is, uh, which was written down about 200 AD, but um, the the oral traditions behind the Mishnah probably are earlier than that. And and there we find the the verb asur. I'm not sure how good my Hebrew pronunciation is, but mm-hmm. asur, the verb meaning to bind, and mutar, meaning loosed. Um, those two, well, they're more like adjectives, I suppose, in that form. Um, they are used frequently in the Mishnah. Um, I'll just maybe give you, if I may, a couple of examples just for illustration. So in in, um, Mishnah Nedarim, which is a a tractate about vows, Mm -hmm. um, it talks about someone who has made a vow to abstain from certain foods. And it says, if one said, cooked food is konam for me, meaning, you know, I've vowed to abstain from it. And for that reason, I will not taste it. He is prohibited, but... The word is literally bound. He's bound from tasting a loose cooked food, but is loosed or permitted to taste a thick one, which people do not generally refer to as a cooked food. So it's making a distinction. One type of food, he his vow has prohibited him from eating, but another type of food he's permitted, he's loosed to eat. Uh, another, another example from Mishnah Avodah Zarah, which is a tractate on idolatry. And it's talking about, you know, what what are Jews, what kind of items are Jews allowed to get from Gentiles and they're still kind of kosher. So it says, and these are items that belong to Gentiles and are bound, meaning prohibited. Milk that was milked by a Gentile and a Jew did not see him performing this action and their bread and their oil. And these are loosed, meaning permitted for consumption. Milk that was milked by a Gentile and a Jew watched him doing so, and honey. So there are certain foods you can get it from a Gentile and it's it's bound. It's you can't eat it. Mm-hmm. And there's other ones that you can get from a Gentile and it's loosed. It's okay. And the last one I will cite from the Mishnah. Um, it's kind of a humorous one actually, from the tractate Mishnah Shabbat about the Sabbath rules. Um, and it's it's concerning 
items that it's permitted or prohibited to go out with on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So it says, a false tooth as well as a gold tooth, Rabbi Yehuda the prince looses going out with it, meaning he allows it, <laughs> and the rabbis pro bind doing so. So some rabbis are okay with wearing a false tooth on the Sabbath, and <laughs> others say, no, you can't. But the important thing for our purposes here is that um, the, the language of binding and loosing is, is used. So it seems pretty clear, even though this is a bit later than Matthew, it seems that in, in rabbinic uh, parlance, the idea of binding being prohibiting something mm -hmm. and loosing being permitting something was pretty well established. And even, you know, from the first century, uh, Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, uh, writing at the near the end of the first century in his work Wars of the Jews, which is maybe, you know, two decades at most after Matthew, um, he he writes about the Pharisees. Um, there, these are a certain sect of the Jews that appear more religious than others and seem to interpret the laws more accurately. And he's talking about a certain um, uh, monarch, Alexander or queen, I suppose. And it says, now Alexandra hearkened to them to an extraordinary degree as being herself a woman of great piety towards God. But these Pharisees artfully insinuated themselves into her favor by little and little and became themselves the real administrators of the public affairs. They banished and reduced whom they pleased. They bound and loosed at their pleasure. And to say all at once, they had the enjoyment of the royal authority, while, whilst the expenses and the difficulties of it belonged to Alexandra. So I think this is a fascinating parallel as well, because it sums up this language of binding and loosing by saying that it's, it's the exercise of royal authority. And mm -hmm. this is from a Jewish source, roughly contemporary with the Gospel of Matthew. So I think when, when you take all of that together, um, I would say that, you know, for, for Matthew, binding and loosing means having the authority to, um, to, to make rules, to make binding rules on the faithful in terms of what's permitted and what's prohibited. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that's what Matthew says, or Jesus says in Matthew, when, when Peter does this, he has the backing of heaven. So it's, unimpeachable authority so i mean th that's um that's a pretty strong case for a magisterium at the very least yeah and mm -hmm. then i think i would say maybe the the burden of proof may be on the one who would say well yeah jesus established this magisterial authority for peter but then there was no intention that it should go beyond peter's lifetime mm -hmm. i mean it's almost like saying that jesus was wasn't thinking ahead uh he was only planning for the first generation of christianity and yet he says at the end of the gospel of matthew i'm with you even to the end of the age right so yeah i think it's a pretty i think there's a pretty strong case to be made there yeah i mean i have so many thoughts on, on what you said uh maybe to start with just the keys and binding and loosing yeah the way that i would approach that is you know, using the image of the keys as the summative image of what Peter's going to do, and then binding and loosing as the specification of how exactly the keys are going to open and shut in this new kingdom, right, this new era. And so um, it would involve halakhic decisions. But I think, as you mentioned with other passages where it also refers to exorcism, right, uh, that's important as well. And, you know, one, I, you know, some people think like, oh, it has to be exorcism or it has to be hal halakha. It can't be one or the other. And in my mind, I think, no, it could be both. Right. Because using that image of, well, one is that I, I would consider it to be a royal key. Right. But it's a royal key that's applied to free prisoners. Right. Who are either under the dominion of sin or the devil in that way um, and needing to be guided to truth. Right. To the kingdom of God. And I also think about how you know, for example, in Luke chapter four, verse 18, Jesus talks about how the spirit of the Lord is on him and he's come to free captives and prisoners, right? There's that, there's that image there being used again of people who don't have, you know, the way of Christ and they need to be guided. So they need to be freed. And so I would see them binding, loosing as the specification of how the keys operate. But like what you were saying, the, the connection between opening and shutting and binding and loosing um, even if the verbs are different, even if the words are different, right? Um, the function 
is the same. There's a functional equivalence there that retains the connection. Um, now, there was something else that you mentioned that I found really interesting, and it was like right at the end. So I'm trying to remember everything in that wonderful kind of <laughs> that wonderful exegesis that you did. Um, let me see. What was what was the last point that you just uh, had said? Well, I was talking about um, the quotation from Josephus. Yeah. Um, and, and how, you know, Josephus himself says that when the Pharisees bound and loosed at their pleasure, they were enjoying royal authority. Mm -hmm. Um so I think, and, you know, you know, um, a, another connection there is that in Matthew 18, you know, the same expression about binding and loosing is found. And there it's, it's in connection with um, basically excommunication or it's, that's in the context in which the statement is made. And, and so I think that pr perhaps lends credence to your point that maybe binding and loosing is not this monolithic Thing, but it's something it's quite a broad authority mm -hmm. because it extends to decisions about who's in good standing or not within the church right and and you know even in josephus quotation right before he mentions binding and loosing he says they banished and reduced whom they pleased and excommunication mm -hmm. is basically banishment from the church so mm -hmm. that connection is there as well yeah, you know, and it's it's fun that you mentioned this because in my uh, academic writing sample to my the graduate programs I applied to, it, my writing sample was on binding and loosing. So this is so much fun. Um, you know, I, another Mishnah pa Mishnah passage before we continue, just uh, Mishnah Pesachim four five, where it says, let's see, with regard to performing labor on the night before Passover Eve, the night between the thirteenth and fourteenth of Nisan, Bait Shemai. Uh, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. <laughs> uh, the, the school of Shammai prohibit performing labor and the school of Hillel permit doing so until sunrise. So one prohibits, one permits. I just thought since we're going to the Mishnah, that would be a fun connection to add in as well to the bucket. But Thomas, okay, this was great. Uh, I, I really loved hearing your thoughts on this. And once again, for, for those of you who are watching, definitely check out the blog post because I was looking at it, my jaw dropped because I'm like, one, this is very well written. And two, it was almost everything that I had thought about, you know, and so I, I felt kind of guilty, like, you know, I didn't, I didn't see this until like, what, a few months ago. And so when I saw it, it just blew me away. And I'm just like, why, you know, I, I'd love for you to get attention for all the work that you've done as well. But um, Thomas, uh, do you think in 30 minutes, we could talk about the Trinity? <laughs> Or would that be a bit too much um, or too little? We could maybe we, we could maybe touch on it. We won't obviously won't do it justice, but we can touch on a couple of things maybe. Yeah, well, um, sure. So, you know, this is obviously connected to your ministry to the Christa, uh, Christa Delphians and other non-Trinitarian forms of, well, uh, other non-Trinitarian um, Jesus movements. Maybe we can call them that. Um so Thomas, uh, talk to me about your kind of ministry, maybe, and the arguments and the objections that you hear and how you approach some of them. And we might not get into the full thing, but just within 30 minutes, you know, give me your spiel. <laughs> okay, sure. So yeah, um, I would say I, I uh, have a ministry through my blog, um, plus some other online interactions with some individuals privately. Who, who reach out to me or small groups, um, what does it look like? So it's entirely online because I have no face-to-face -face interactions with Christadelphians currently, except, you know, maybe when I'm visiting my family or the, or family members are visiting me. Um, and secondly, I would say it, it's a rather lonely ministry because it's, it's a very niche, you could say a very niche area of apologetics or evangelization. Um, I mean, it's a very small audience that I'm trying to reach. We're talking probably in the tens of thousands globally. Um, and it's not a well understood target audience by the wider church. And so you can, you know, you can spend a lot of time on a blog post knowing that it might reach like a couple of hundred hits. Um, but at the same time, you know, each of those people who might view the blog post is a person that Christ died for. And, and some of those people might be my close relatives, my loved ones. So the unlikelihood of my work going viral uh, doesn't really 
bother me um be, because i feel like you know very few people are reaching out to christadelphians and other biblical unitarian groups and almost no one is doing so from a catholic perspective so i feel that god has laid a burden on me it's like if if you don't do it then who's going to do it um so i sort of feel like i'm out of necessity i need to to have this ministry and the other thing is those that do reach out to groups like Christadelphians often do so with a very harsh message, uh, like certain evangelical fundamentalists, that the message is basically, you belong to a cult, and unless you accept that Jesus is God, you're going straight to hell. That That's kind of like the message. And, uh, you know, that that's not a very compelling uh, way to present the, the truth, and it's it's not even really the truth um it's it needs to be stated with a lot more nuance than that first of all um whether christadelphians can be classified as a cult is a sociological question i think but um it's it's certainly a pejorative label once once you call a group oh they're a cult then all kinds of red flags and alarm bells go off and you're like oh are they like you know waco texas david koresh type of thing and so I think it it can be it's it's not a charitable way to describe a group. I would prefer to call Christadelphians a sect, without denying that in certain people's experience, um, there have been sort of cult-like phenomena that manifest themselves in terms of uh, the way that the, the experiences that some people have gone through within the movement. But it's not like any other uh, religious movement has not had its share of uh bad experiences um the the other thing that needs to be nuanced is that the idea that, as i alluded to earlier the idea that oh you're going straight to hell you're not a christian um you know i think as catholics we take a more generous view of, of god's mercy and uh the church is open to the possibility that people who are not formally baptized christians um could still be saved not that they necessarily will be we don't declare that they are saved but we we leave it open to god as the judge so i think that allows us to give a more nuanced message and and i think uh if you're evangelizing it's supposed to be good news so it should be phrased positively and for me you know one biblical text that really speaks powerfully to christadelphians is Revelation 22, 17, where we read right at the end of the Bible, the spirit and the bride say, come. Now, granted, in context, uh, scholars debate whether are the spirit and the bride saying, come to Jesus? Like, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Are they inviting Jesus to return? Or are the words addressed to the reader as an invitation? Because the, the words right immediately following are like, um, whoever wills, whoever is, is thirsty, let him come and drink of the water of life, right? So it, it could be that part of that invitation. Uh, but in either case, and, and I think it's more likely that it is the invitation to the reader, but in either case, the Holy Spirit and the bride, which is the church, are speaking together. And these two voices are voices that Christadelphians have historically not been listening for because they have a very low pneumatology, meaning the Holy Spirit is basically inactive and inaccessible at this point in time, and a very low ecclesiology where the, the church as a, as a body does not have any authority to um, declare doctrine and, and teach um, doctrine to the faithful. So, you know, I think um, that's a verse that I would bring up if I'm talking to a Christadelphian to say, look, maybe these are two voices that you've been missing out on. Um, I am thinking about starting a podcast and perhaps maybe appearing on yours is a, is a good start. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for that invitation. Yeah. Um, I, I know that it's probably quite demanding on time and I'm at a pretty busy phase of my life. So that's weighing on me a bit, but at the same time, I think it is a good way to, it's a good format. You know, you can be out for a jog and you can be listening to a podcast, so you can be driving. So it's, it's a good way to reach people that may not want to sit and read a very long article. Mm-hmm.
so that's that's kind of uh where things stand in terms of my ministry so i don't know if we can then go a bit further into the the trinity without having time to do it properly <laughs> you know you know what i'm thinking thomas um i know that i know that you're a busy guy but if maybe we could do an episode on the trinity and then an episode on your work on on you know s- satanology or something that would be i think that would be the best what are your thoughts on that yeah i, I i'm inclined to agree i mean we're already almost an hour and a half <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. so <laughs> to start on the trinity at this point in time <laughs> seems to be biting off more than we can chew <laughs> right but no thomas like what what you said today it's just it's wonderful when you when you talked about revelation was it 22 17 um right at the end of the book basically um and you talked about the Holy Spirit and the bride saying, come that really, I mean, even for me as, you know, a Catholic, and even when I was thinking about my conversion into the church, when I was Baptist and this idea that for most of my life, I have basically been homeless as a Christian and that the church, this home on earth in a way, but that's also connected to heaven. That was always where I was supposed to be. And so it was like, you know, finding, meeting my mother for the first time, you know, I've been told for years that my mother was, you know, um, you know, the woman in Babylon, and she was, um, you know, uh, all, all this and that and all these things. And then when I finally met her, I was astonished at how beautiful she was, you know, and so that was, I just found that to be so beautiful, um, what you brought up. And also Thomas, like, you know, exegesis, your arguments, I just find so much of it to be solid. And maybe that's why, you know, your brain works so well as a statistician, right? The precision, the accuracy of things. So yeah, Thomas, I, I've been so blessed by this conversation today and by your story. Yeah, me too. Um, it's been it's been a joy to have this conversation. And I also must say that your podcast has been a blessing to me. Um you know, the episodes, they're always very rich and Mm -hmm. you have some great guests on there. I mean, I was, I think I was telling you by email the other week that I was a bit worried when you invited me on because you previously (laughs) had, uh, what is it? Timothy, uh, Timothy Rucker, his name, Mm -hmm. Timothy Rucker, who just finished his PhD on, uh, on the connection (laughs) between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, what do I have to offer after a, <laughs> a, a PhD in biblical studies? But um, nevertheless, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a few thoughts. And uh, I would very much be happy to come back and mm-hmm. talk about some of these other topics. And by the way, Thomas, where where can we find your work? Are you still active on the blog? Or um, do you have any, I mean, obviously, I think you did mention that you're still blogging um, and ministering to Christadelphians, but uh, what's the name of the blog? So the blog is, um, the URL is blog.dianoigo.com. So the, that's D-I-A-N-O-I-G-O. It's, uh, it's a Greek verb used in the New Testament, which means like to open the mind. Mm. Um, Jesus uses it in, after his resurrection in Luke 24, mm. uh, when they, I think on the road to Emmaus, when they were, they were unable to understand, you know, that Christ was supposed to suffer and die. And then it says Christ opened their minds to understand the scriptures concerning himself. So um, Mm blog.dianoigo.com. I also have a website, www.dianoigo.com, but that's more for like formal articles. um, And it's not updated very often. Even the blog um, hasn't been updated for a few months better mm-hmm. part of a year i think because i was really busy finishing my phd yeah and now mm-hmm. that that's out of the way i've been thinking of pivoting towards uh podcasting as trying a different format but there's a lot of i mean there's hundreds of articles on the blog going back more than a decade so you know some of them written long before i was a catholic mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. sort of they sort of document my my journey as well and um uh, m- Quite an quite a large proportion of them are targeted in some way towards a Christadelphian or Unitarian audience, mm-hmm. um, because I, as I said, I think that's the the niche area of evangelization that I'm called to fill. So there's not, I'm not so much dealing with sort of your classical Catholic Protestant mm-hmm. um, 
theological differences because I that there's a lot of great people uh, working in that space, doing a lot of great work in that space. And I don't think I would be able to do it justice as the way that they are like yourself. Mm. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, I mean, you're, you're also an inspiration, you know, at your, at your young age to be doing the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's really amazing. Hey, Thomas, I appreciate that. And uh, for all the listeners who are listening in or all the viewers who are watching, thank you so much.